Hey, 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 what's up? Welcome to Feminist Time Out. Let's take a time out to talk about feminism and Orientalism. Orientalism is a very specific sort of racism. It has to do with these concepts of the East and the West. Now these concepts are pretty complicated. What they're useful for is talking about the way that we divide up the world. So when we talk about the West, we're talking about countries that have been able to dominate other countries. These are the countries that we would also refer to as first world or developed. The West originally consisted of countries like Britain, France, and has expanded to include countries like Canada and the US. And when we're talking about the East, we're talking about countries that the West benefited from exploiting. Or maybe are benefiting from still exploiting. The East was originally made up of countries like India and the majority of the Middle East, and has now been expanded to include other parts of Asia. And not all countries easily fit into these. That's not the point. The point is, is that historically, these categories have benefited Western countries and not Eastern countries. The concept of Orientalism was come up by this guy named Edward Said. I put his head on a pencil so you would know what he would look like. In his book called Orientalism, Edward Said explains that Orientalism as a concept was invented by the West in order to deal with otherness. It was something that was created by people to help them interpret the world. And as such, it's not innocent. It serves certain interests. In an Orientalist framework, the Orient's opposite is the Occident. The term Occident is what we use to refer to the West. The Occident and the Orient act as foils. What that means is that we can describe what the West looks like by what the East is not. And Edward Said tells us that Orientalism says way more about the West than it does about the East. In Western consciousness, the East came to stand in for everything that the West was not. Whereas the West was civilized and developed, the East was thought to be backwards and barbaric. Whereas the West defined itself as logical and enlightened, the East was seen to be as emotional and unreasonable. And this is where we can start to see that Orientalism is an extremely nefarious thing. Orientalism exists to show that the West is better. What we need to understand for our purposes of exploring Orientalism in feminism is to understand that Orientalism changes. Orientalism as a way of dealing with those who aren't Western is still around today. Orientalism is extremely flexible. No matter what the relationship is between the East and the West, the West will always be in a position of superiority. Orientalism is about maintaining a distinction between the East and the West. It's about maintaining the power of the West. And it's about making sure that the West can continue to control others. Why would the West want to control others? Well, countries like Britain and France, and more recently America and Canada, have really benefited by being able to exploit other countries. Whether it's taking their land or resources or turning the people living there into resources, the West has gotten rich by exercising power over others. There's this other theorist named Stuart Hall, and he does an interesting thing, which is talk about the way that discourses and power are tied to one another. A discourse is a way of representing something that affects how we can talk about it. I'll talk more about discourses in another video. Stuart Hall talks about how having power means you have the power to make things true. And if you have the power to make things true, then that means you have the power to make knowledge. And when you get to make knowledge about somebody, you get to exercise your power over them and you get to enforce that knowledge about them. Our guy Edward Said has this concept of the Archive of the Orient. This is a compendium of literature, stories, songs, these concepts that inform the idea of what the Orient looks like. And this archive isn't stagnant. The archive interacts with each other. The archive, which was once myth and biblical stories, has evolved to include anthropology and sociology and science and even media. The ideas in the West that we have in the Orient are Western productions. They're things that we have made up to talk about other people. And because the West has so much power culturally, militarily, monetarily, that power operates to enforce this truth. As an example of this, we can talk about the image of veiled women. Now, honestly, I wish we didn't have to still talk about veiled women. Various authors have pointed out that in mainstream feminism, we're a little bit obsessed with veiled women. And we have been for a long time. And a lot of Muslim women have said, can you please stop debating about the veil? But it seems like, at least for now, us white Western women are still stuck on it. So if we insist on talking about it, let's at least try to talk about the issue in a way that might allow us to build a stronger, less exclusive feminism. So right now, let's try to reimagine the way that we consider the veil by comparing it to some other ways that we think about clothing. To demonstrate this, I want to talk about two different texts. 
The first text is Lila Abu Lughold, Do Muslim Women Really Need Saving? The second text is Huma Hufar's The Veil in Their Minds and on Our Heads. Orientalism operates with shorthands. Orientalism creates images that makes it easier for us to interpret the world. The shorthand of the veil that Orientalism creates for the West is that a veiled woman is the very epitome of the oppressed women. A woman wearing a veil is both being denied her agency and also excluded from society. Hudfar points out that mainstream feminism has actually appropriated the image of Muslim women in order to fight sexism. We need to be suspicious of where these images come from and how feminism is using them, especially because this image is man-made. It comes from a time of colonization in the 18th and the 19th century. And while Europeans have been interacting with Middle Eastern people long before then, the veil wasn't seen as a source of problem until a period of colonization. At this point, the veiled woman became an image that was used for colonial propaganda. In imagining veiled women as oppressed, Muslim men were able to be imagined as ignorant, backwards brutes whose very masculinity depended on mistreatment of women. When countries were able to look at the Middle East like that, well then they could excuse colonization and imposing military states for the good of everyone, especially for the good of Muslim women. The idea that the West was using to dominate other countries was that Arabs had to be saved by Europe. This portrayal of Middle Eastern men and women Sounds pretty familiar, because this is still how we're talking about them. Both authors advise us to reimagine how we consider women and clothing. Abu Laghad points out that all different cultures have different concepts of what it's acceptable to wear and what it's not acceptable to wear. I wouldn't go to a job interview dressed for the beach. Hudfar makes the argument that the purpose of clothing is to say stuff about our social class, where we come from, what gender we are. Clothing is an expression of values. And when we start talking about the veil like this, instead of the way that we have to within an Orientalist framework, then we can start to understand that just because in the West we imagine ourselves as free doesn't mean people who aren't like us aren't free. And as feminists, we need to be particularly careful about how we've imagined the veil means social exclusion. Hudfar traces the history of veiling in Iran. She talks about how part of the culture in Iran was for Muslim women to be able to move about the city, to be able to make economic deals for themselves, to run errands, meet up with their social networks. When a new government came to power and wanted to assert their modernism, they tried to force women to be veiled. This deveiling was enforced by police. When women went into the streets wearing their veils, police officers would chase them down, tear it from their head, and destroy it. What this resulted in was for women who could, they just didn't leave the house. This was all done with a Western idea of progress that the government was trying to emulate. I think this is a really good example of how what's good for Western women isn't always good for women not in the West. And while Western women didn't take over the Iranian government and impose the deveiling policy, Western women largely are in support of the idea of deveiling, which we can see with current debates in Canada and various laws being passed in France. In the West, when we picture deveiling, we don't picture the often violent and shameful process in which women are forced into this idea of liberation that they are assumed to just get used to. Hudfar stresses that these policies don't actually lead to liberation. And also, why is that what liberation looks like? Further. I think we need to be extremely suspicious of any idea that says police brutality will aid women. If we're even going to accept that that is what liberation looks like. And the point of this video is to say, maybe liberation doesn't always look the same. I think we need to rethink what this idea of agency or self-determination or power over one's own life means. I want to consider that these Western ideas are based on a very narrow conception of agency. Agency for me means authority over my movement, my identity, my choices. And it seems from what Abu Lakhold and Hufar are saying, it means the same thing to a lot of Muslim women. But just because I express that in one way, doesn't mean that somebody else needs to express that in the exact same way. Abu Lakhold talks about how a lot of Western feminists get confused that when Middle Eastern countries get liberated by Western ones, they don't immediately deveil. This causes Abu Lakhold to raise two questions about freedom. The first question is, when Western feminists work for the freedom of women in developing countries, we mean only freedom on our terms. And if we can agree that that's not a good practice, what does freedom look like if we can actually account for the idea that people come from different histories that will lead people to having different values and will lead people to making different choices? And Muslim women have made a lot of different choices based on a lot of different things. Hudfar talks about organizing in Egypt where Muslim women met and discussed tons of issues of society, and a part of their studying the Quran and other texts, they decided to deveil, and they were the first country to do so without government intervention. In Iran, when another government took power and then instituted reveiling, 
Muslim women contested it not on the grounds of religion, but on the grounds of democracy. I think my favorite new thing I learned is how the veil for Muslim women actually gives them a major power play move. Hudvar talks about how in Iran, if a Muslim woman is having a fight with a man and wants to insult him, she'll be veil. And this is because in Muslim practice, one doesn't have to wear a veil around someone they don't consider to be man enough, which is rad as hell. We, as Western women, don't need to teach Muslim women about democracy. We don't need to teach them about critical thinking. They already know these things. What we do need to do is think about how Orientalist ideas are a huge part of feminism. We need to think about the way that these Orientals images are having negative impacts on Muslim women. These ideas about Muslim women are extremely exclusionary. And who would want to be a part of a society constantly telling them that they are not being as the, in the world as a person should want to be in the world? It's gross. It's awful. And even worse, when feminists uphold these ideas, we're contributing to unsafe environments for women. Islamophobia is so huge right now. Things are happening in America. Putting forward the idea that not only is Islamophobia and Orientalism right, but that it's okay. And so I think we might need to consider that a Muslim woman wearing a veil might be just as radical as a white Western woman wearing a shirt that says nasty woman. Maybe it's even more disruptive to current power structures. So to all of my fellow white Western women, we need to sort ourselves out. We need to identify these Orientalist ideas, investigate them, and find a way to get rid of them. We need to be vigilant against any image that places us in a position of rightness and women in the East in a position of wrongness. And hopefully I don't have to say this, but the reason we have to do this is as feminists, we need to oppose any structure that says that one group of people is better than another. As feminists, we have to look out for the interests of all women, not just women in the West. We need to make sure that whiteness isn't the center of the feminist experience. Because if whiteness is the center, it's a racist movement. And if it's a racist movement, it's not a movement for equality, and it's not a movement against oppression. And none of this is to say that Muslim women don't face patriarchy. It's to say that patriarchy operates differently. And if we want to resist patriarchy, then we can't utilize something that goes hand in hand with patriarchy, like Orientalism. The last thing I want to talk about is some analysis by Daniel Francis. In The Imaginary Indian, Daniel Francis talks about the way that images of Native Americans were created and propagated. Now, we shouldn't conflate the experiences of Native Americans with those of Muslim folks. But the reason I brought him up is he says something really interesting about images. He talks about how we can't have fair and equitable relationships with a fantasy. And the way that we talk about Muslim women is a fantasy. And so if we want to have fair and equitable relationships, we can't engage with Muslim women based on Orientalist fantasies. All right, so tell me what you think. Um, are there any other ways that feminism's Orientalist? There are other ways that we can resist Orientalism? Let's keep talking about it in the comments below.